Welcome to worship at Middleton Community United Church of Christ, where we say that no matter who you are or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here. Today's reading is from Exodus, the third chapter. The first 15 verses can be found on page 55 in the Hebrew scripture portion of the Bible in the seat pocket in front of you or on the screens. I'm looking forward to Pastor Zena interacting with this text. <laughs> Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign that for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Here ends our scripture reading for this morning. May God bless our receiving, our understanding, and our living. I've heard him say before to live just like you're dying, yeah. Wish I could say that's how I am, but I'd be lying, yeah. Lying in my bed at night, one too many times I'm thinking, what if, what if? My biggest fear is waking up to find what matters is miles away from what I spend my life chasing after. Is my story gonna have the same two words in every chapter? What if, what if? The last I checked, this heart inside my chest is still beating. Well, I guess it's not too late. What if today's the only day I got? Don't want to waste it if it's my last shot. Oh, no regrets in the end. I want to know I got no I'm running till the road runs out I'm lighting it up, I'm right here, right now Oh, no regrets in the end I wanna know, I got no what is, yeah See, 
I refuse to be a shoulda, woulda, coulda been. I can't go back in time, I don't have a DeLorean. What I'm trying to say is I don't want to say these words again. What if, what if, but last I checked, this heart inside my chest is still beating. Well, I guess it's not too late. No, no. What if today's the only day I got? I don't want to waste it if it's my last shot. Oh, no regrets in the end. I want to know, I got no what ifs. I'm running till the road runs out. I'm lighting it up, I'm right here, right now. Oh, no regrets in the end. I want to know, I got no September communicator, you'll know a little bit of this story already uh, because I was thinking about this text as I wrote it. My grandmother uh, loved to be barefoot, and I, uh, as you might know by now, like to be like my grandmother. So I grew up often being barefoot. I mean, everywhere. Uh, when I was a kid, I hated wearing shoes. I still hate wearing shoes. Uh, one of the things my grandmother taught me uh, was in our driving lessons. As soon as she got in the car, she'd slip off her shoes, no matter the weather, and kind of stuff them under the seat <laughs> and drive barefoot, which I'm told maybe isn't the safest, but I have to tell you, I do it as well. Um, uh, at home, I am barefoot the minute I walk in the door in the backyard. I am barefoot. I put off wearing shoes that require socks for as long as possible because that means that it's one more step uh, to slipping shoes on and off. If you come to my office and I'm sitting behind my desk uh, and I need to get up, you might notice that I have to put my, my shoes on first before I wander out into the rest of the church building. I ran through tall grasses as a kid. I walked up the creek near our home until it became the Crawfish River, uh, all barefoot, always running around the neighborhood barefoot. In our scripture today, we get this story of Moses coming across this burning bush in the wilderness, a bush uh, that is on fire but not being consumed. And the first thing that God asks of Moses in that uh, space is to remove his shoes. He says, take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. Now, this isn't a thing that happens often in scripture, right? Like, it's not a thing that we hear people going into holy ground, they should take off their shoes. It happens in one other space um, in the book of, uh, with Joshua. Um, Joshua is asked by God to take off his shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. We get uh, people taking off their shoes for other reasons. In the book of Ruth, 
um, somebody takes off a shoe to mark a covenant, to mark a contract with somebody, that passing a shoe in some way marks this promise that they've made to one another, this agreement. Or, of course, we have in the Gospels when Jesus removes the shoes of uh, the disciples to wash their feet in the upper room, removes their, sh their shoes on what becomes really holy ground, not just in the mo that moment, but in the stories that Christians tell for generations. Take off your shoes, you are standing on holy ground. So there are cultures where it's really common to take off your shoes, right? Not as much in the United States, but there are parts of the world, especially in Japan, where it, it's expected to take off your shoes when you're entering spaces, so much so that you might have uh, multiple slippers for different parts of a building, right? And there was a survey done not too long ago that asked um, people in Japan why it was that they took off their shoes beyond just the, the cultural norm of it. And 81% of the people in this survey answered two main reasons, and they held both of them, right? Not just one or the other. It wasn't that these were ranked. It was that they held these two reasons for uh, taking off their shoes. The first, which seems kind of obvious, is cleanliness, right? To, to leave all the dirt and the grime from outside there at the door and to remove your shoes. But the second was to feel comfortable and at ease to feel comfortable and at ease by taking off your shoes. Now, if we were to look at these reasons and apply them to the story of Moses here, um, I don't think he took off his shoes for cleanliness. I don't think that's what God wanted, right? He was wandering uh, through a desert space. Uh, his feet were not going to be clean, and they weren't going to get clean in that moment. But I wonder, I wonder, if part of why God asked Moses to take off his shoes on this holy ground was because God was going to have a really big ask for Moses. And God was inviting Moses to show up fully and authentically. Asking God to show up in that way that maybe sometimes we can only show up in our own homes, right? Where the doors are shut and the expectation of the outside world isn't allowed in. Take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. Take off your shoes, because on this ground, you are invited to be here, to stand here holy as yourself. Take off your shoes, because this is holy ground, and I want this ground to connect physically with you, with no barriers. No uh, guards up. It's interesting that uh, God goes on to make this big ask of Moses, right? He says, I've heard the plight of my people in Israel. I've seen uh, that they have cried out. I have heard their cries uh, from slavery, and I have uh, decided to rescue them, and you're going to be the one to do it. Now, Moses shows up fully and authentically and says no. <laughs> um, you know, there's an, another argument, right, that maybe Moses takes off his shoes uh, because he needs to stand in reverence of God, but Moses shows no reverence to God in this scene, right? There is no fear, uh, there is curiosity, there is question, and there is challenge. So we don't read all of the verses today, but uh, Moses gives five excuses for not uh, following through with what God has asked him to do, right? Excuses like, who am I? I'm nobody. Uh, I don't know what to say. I'm not that great at saying it. And time and again, God says, I am calling you to this work, and I will be with you in this work, and I will give you the words and the way in this work. There's an old uh, Hasidic story that I first uh, read in a small book by Parker Palmer um, called Let Your Life Speak. And it's a story by, uh, it, go it goes like this. 
Rabbi Zusia, when he was an old man, said, in the world to come, they will not ask me, why were you not more like Moses? Rather, they will ask me, why were you not more like Zusia? That is, when we show up with our authentic self to the work that God calls us to, we are not being asked to show up to be some image of what we think that God or society wants us to be. That God calls Moses exactly how he is, without the words, with the pretty complicated backstory, and says, you are the one that I want to do this work. You are the one who is uniquely fitted to the job that I have for you. And even in the places that you fall short, I will be there with you. It seems fitting to me on this Labor Day weekend that we take a moment to pause and to evaluate the work that we do and the work that we are called to do. I think this is especially important for those of us who have the privilege of space and security to even begin to ask questions about the work that we do. Because we too, as the people of God, are called, are called by God to respond in some big ways, are called to respond to the same vision and uh, work that Moses was called to, even if we're not called to it in the same way. That vision that Moses eventually agreed to was a vision of a world where all workers were valued, where God's people were free and benefited from their own labor, where the pharaohs of the world were no longer allowed to hoard resources produced by those in poverty, a world where those who clean houses are also able to afford to buy their own house and live in it. A world where those who grow food can afford to have their fill. A world for those who serve and care for others, for themselves to be served and cared for. And God invites us into this own vision, knowing exactly who we are knowing that, as uh, God reminds us in this text, God is God, period, end of sentence, which means God is God and we are not. God is love and you are God's beloved. You are called, you are equipped, and you are not alone. You are capable and you work as only part of a community. So God invites us into this space, into this weekend, and invites us to take off our shoes, to ground ourselves in that which is holy, in that which is love, and to know that we belong to something bigger than ourselves. May it be so, and amen. So we're going to share a short video to learn a little bit about one of our mission partners and the work that we d- they do, uh, and I invite you to hold them in prayer as we come back together. talk to you a little bit about the work we do here at the Worker Center. We dedicate ourselves to the construction of collective worker power. Concretely, what that means is that we offer trainings to workers uh, on their workplace rights, and we also uh, work with employees who want to build campaigns for concrete improvements in their workplaces. A lot of our work also focuses on empowering the Latinx and immigrant community. For me, my biggest satisfaction is to see people like eh, sale de aquí empoderada así como yo tenía ese miedo quiero que al final la gente tenga esa confianza de venir y no espera tanto tiempo para, para sus derechos y que tengan que sientan ese poder que acá hay un lugar a donde podemos ayudarlos y que pierdan ese miedo People of faith believe in the intrinsic dignity of every person Yet we see every day 
that the immigrant and BIPOC workers we partner with here at Worker Justice Wisconsin are not treated with the dignity and respect they deserve. They are underpaid and their wages are stolen and they're pressured into working in unsafe conditions. And their employers don't think much about it because they don't believe anybody will care. I know that people of faith do care, that you want to combat these economic and racial injustices in the workplace. When you support us, either by signing our faith and labor statement or showing up to worker actions or by making a donation, you give courage to the workers most directly impacted by these injustices to stand up for their rights and the dignity they deserve. As a former campus minister, Catholic social teaching has deeply informed my belief in worker justice, which includes the right to fair wages, the right to safe working conditions, and the right to organize. From my many conversations with my brothers and sisters of diverse faith traditions, I know that you share these values. Our traditions compel us to support workers as they advocate for their rights as human beings. To paraphrase theologian Johann Baptist Metz, none of us have dignity until all of us have dignity. This is why I believe that faith allies should be integrally involved in the promotion of worker justice. There are many ways that you, our faith and community allies, can help support us. And one of those main ways is by hosting a training at your congregation or community space. We offer trainings on workers' rights as employees and also on collective worker organizing, which is a main way that workers can defend their own rights and make improvements in their workplaces. We also offer trainings on cooperatives for workers that want to become worker owners and participate democratically in their own workplaces. Please consider uh, hosting us at one of your community spaces. Another way you can get involved with workers justice is by making a donation to our workers solidarity fund. This fund provides direct financial support to workers engaged in workplace campaign. Those who qualify to receive this fund are workers who walked off the job because they needed to put pressure on their employers for a better and safer work, working conditions. Those who are fired for retaliation for organizing in the workplace. By making a donation to the Workers Solidarity Fund, you are contributing to workers' empowerment and providing an important economic safety net for those who need advocacy for themselves and facing unjust work conditions. Thank you. So we hold uh, those who are doing the work at Worker Justice Wisconsin, as well as those that they serve in our prayers today. For a few weeks, uh, we are hearing from folks who nominated organizations or efforts to our Surprising Gift campaigns. Surprising Gifts happens at MCC twice a year, and it's an opportunity for anyone in the community to recommend an organization to our Board of Mission and Stewardship. And then the board chooses several of those to give just a random financial gift to in the middle of the year. And so today we're going to be hearing from Randall Crow, who will be sharing a little bit about Middleton Youth Center, who was a recent recipient of uh, a surprising gift. Um, first of all, a little history. Um, according to my kids, it would be ancient history <laughs> back in the late 1970s. Um, that's when I was in um, what we called um, junior high. We had a three-year junior high, which was grade seventh, eighth, and ninth. Our high school was just a three-year high school. Um, this was back in Elgin, Illinois. Um, in my junior high school, we had um, predominantly white, middle-class, working-class kids. Um, we did have some, some blacks. We did have what we would, at that time, would have called Mexicans. Um, we had no gay students, no lesbian students, no bi students. And that was because they weren't recognized at that time. Um, and if anybody were to come out and say that they were gay or lesbian, they would have been ridiculed and shunned. Um, so for me, um, going through middle, sc middle school, junior high school, um, 
we appeared very homogenous. Um, and we had, um, again, socioeconomically, we were very similar, middle class, working middle class. Kids went home after school if they weren't involved in sports. Um, the presumption was that their dads were working, their moms were home, which wasn't always true. Um, both of my parents worked, um, but I had a safe place to go after school. Um, I was also considered a good student, so I went home and did my homework. <laughs> I, again, I had a safe place to do that. The Middleton Youth Center um, is centered at Cromery Middle School here in Middleton. And they, I became involved with them be, when I became involved with the um, city of Middleton as an alder person. It was one of the committees that I was assigned to. Um, and it was my first year as an alder person. Um, what does the Middleton Youth Center do and how does that fit in with Middleton Community Church? Uh, Pastor Zaina talked about being your authentic self today. Middleton Youth Center allows youth to be authentic. Um, they have programs for kids and their, their programs are after school um, and run until six o'clock. Um, gives a place for students to go who might ha not have a safe place to go. Um, they run all kinds of programs, um, structured programs, as well as some free time for kids to go to the gym, uh, play sports. Um, they have mini courses that will run for about a month at a time where kids can learn different skills. They do cooking classes, they do arts and crafts classes. Um, they do, some of their gym classes are geared toward activity, physical activity and being involved in, in doing that. Um, the Middleton Youth Center also runs a program during the summer months, um, so it's not just in the after school. They do um, programs from 12 o'clock until about 5.30 in the summer. And again, a lot of these involve um, mini courses, activities for kids to do, um, they go on trips, they go to the Middleton pool, um, things like that. Um, the other thing that the Middleton Youth Center does every year is they do an international fair um, at the end of the school year. Kids and their parents are there with booths showing where they came from, what their cultural heritage is. Um, they often have very good food <laughs> um, that they share with the public in a, in a way of sharing who they are, what their, their backgrounds are, things like that. So I'm, I'm glad that Middleton Community Church recognized Middleton Youth Center. Again, it's a safe place for kids to go after school. It's a safe place for um, parents will know where their kids are after school. Um, so I thank you to the mission, missions and, and stewardship committee for recognizing them. Um, one thing I will add also is that um, the director of the youth center just this week won an award um, from the Madison area out of school time. Um, and she was recognized as one of the outstanding youth leaders in the area, so thank you. As you know, tomorrow is Labor Day, which means the day after that, all of the things start. <laughs> and next Sunday, uh, we invite you to gather here for Connection Sunday. This is the Sunday where we at MCC kick off our program year, uh, where we do all of the things in one day. Uh, and then we'll spread it out a little bit as the year goes on. So we have really exciting worship happening next uh, Sunday. Uh, it's the return of the choir, but not just any choir, our celebration singers 
uh, will be here. The Celebration Singers is a special choir that sings on celebrations and big Sundays and includes uh, folks of all ages. So grade school through adults are welcome to join the Celebration Singers. Um, if you wanted to still sing next week, I think you still could. Uh, there's one more rehearsal after worship today. So if you are uh, a part of the choir, please plan on sticking around. For the rest of worship, um, we will be highlighting. It'll be kind of a variety show of worship, highlighting what work and uh, celebration and fellowship looks like here at MCC. And we'll be lifting up lots of the things that you might not know that we do, uh, but that you can get involved in. And then after worship, there will be a, a connection fair, and all of the boards will be uh, presenting ways that you can plug in to these different projects and ministries. It is also Undies Sunday, which happens again twice a year here at MCC. So if you get a chance this week, please head out and buy um, some new underwear, socks, um, under shirts, anything uh, in that realm to be donated to Way Forward Ministries, formerly known as Middleton Outreach Ministry, and you can bring them here next Sunday and we'll get them where they need to go. And now raise your hand again if you are going back to school last week or this week, or if you're starting classes at home, or yeah, it, what if you're a teacher, you can raise your hand, or an administrator getting ready to welcome kids back to school. Um, I want to invite you to, if you can remember, bring your backpack next week. If you don't use a backpack, if you go to school at home and you have something really, you know, your pencil case, whatever it is, uh, bring that with you to worship next week so that we can share in a blessing of our students and teachers and administrators as they return uh, to a season of learning together uh, in the classroom. And then uh, this week, uh, Coffee and Conversation resumes on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. Coffee and Conversation meets over in the gathering room at 8 a.m. Uh, you could also join by hybrid, and there's a link in the communicator, or I'm sure if you email Anne in the office this week, she can get you the link. Uh, there's coffee and hot chocolate and tea available there. Sometimes I've seen treats show up, some breakfast foods. Uh, but the Coffee and Conversations will be uh, continuing a conversation on the book See No Stranger, uh, starting with chapter 7 this week. So if you're going to come, uh, if you haven't read it, I bet you can still join the conversation. If you want to dive in now, I bet you could skip to chapter 7. It's a great book, worth it wherever you read. All right. And finally, thank you to everyone who gives financially to MCC. Uh, to support the ministry that we do here. If you want to give, you can drop off uh, donations as you leave the sanctuary. There are boxes on the wall right outside the door, or you can give online by going to middletonucc.org.
now, my friends, I invite you to turn toward these doors that I remind you are not an exit, but in week, an entrance into a week of service. As you go from this place, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God look upon you with kindness and give you peace today and every day. Amen.